be talking about uh, city planning and uh, cycling benefits. So why are planners focusing on cycling? Uh, what are the motivations for that? And what are the health benefits that, uh, that come from it? So in my talk, I will talk. Uh, I will focus briefly on uh, the motivation for why we're doing this, why planners are interested in cycling, uh, focus on the role of cities, uh, what cities can do to improve cycling in the population, uh, some observations about why this is working, why it might not work, what are some uh, concerns about it, and finally, I will go ahead and conclude. As a backdrop for my talk, I'm going to suggest uh, why planning and health are are coming together. They were together. I would say that they were born together. That's why I call them uh, having a, a fraternal relationship. They are siblings. Uh, they grew together from uh, the Industrial Revolution, uh, 19th century uh, factories located uh, next to where people lived, or the opposite, people living in factories, or next to factories, uh, pollution billowing in, uh, not a lot of uh, ventilation, not a lot of light. And as a result of these uh, health concerns, uh, planning came into being as a way to dictate how buildings uh, should uh, be specified, where land uses should go, keep this uh, uh, sort of noxious uses away from where people lived, and that way promote health. Uh, through the 20th century, plan, uh, health went in one direction, uh, much more sort of uh, biological based, pathogenic, I would say, uh, with a big impetus on infectious diseases, whereas planning went in a different direction, focused mostly on sort of social scientific uh, uh, approaches. Sort of what's the future about? What are the challenges? What are my alternatives? Let me predict what they could be, and I'll pick the best one so that our uh, urban areas can, can grow and adapt uh, better. It's only until the early this century, and by the year 2000, that the two have come together as we've realized the importance of the built environment, of how we build cities for chronic conditions. And that's when the two are again converging into one, and health is becoming one of the motivations for the activities that planners uh, do. In the next few slides, I'm going to motivate uh, four, four main areas that really help us uh, push uh, cycling into the forefront. They're not exhaustive, uh, and they certainly uh, overlap a little bit with each other, and they're going to be uh, issues of obesity and health, uh, climate change, issues of air quality, and then broadly issues of sustainability. And those are really the main motivations that I think are, are mattering and are pushing planners to think about cycling. So obesity, uh, no news here. We are having an epidemic in obesity. Uh, obesity rates are up, uh, up in, in, in record numbers in the U.S. Uh, roughly about 70% of the population in the U.S. is overweight, uh, including obese. Uh, very high. Uh, if you look at children, it's about uh, adolescents and children. About a third of them are overweight, uh, including obese, a rate that has tripled in the past 30 years. The map that I have here is also to dispel the notion that this is a problem of the global north only. Uh, Latin America has rates that are almost on par with, uh, with North America. Uh, Europe, a similar story. North Africa, uh, Middle East, uh, similar uh, rates of obesity. Uh, of course, we know also that uh, physical inactivity and dietary factors are uh, major contributors to the actual uh, causes of death uh, uh, worldwide. So, so there's a reason why we want to get people a little bit more, uh, more active, and this is driving uh, some of it. Uh, in terms of climate change, there are many motivations why we want to move around differently. The first one is the contribution of transportation to greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, in the U.S., transportation is the second highest source of greenhouse gas emissions, CO2 emissions. Uh, in cities particularly, 70% uh, of all fossil fuel emissions um, are coming from cities. This is transportation. This is also heating and cooling. But uh, cities play a big role in climate change mitigation, and as I've said, mostly through transportation choices, how we get around. At the same time, cities are on the receiving end of climate change. The impact of climate change through uh, adaptation is going to be incredibly important uh, for our cities. By the year 2100, so we're talking 80 years from now, uh, about 110 to 200 million people are going to live in areas that flood recurrently, normally. They're going to be in flooding areas. That's about 2 to 3 percent of the world population. Most of them are going to be living in cities. So the way we build our cities, particularly for places like Africa or uh, uh, Asia, or how we rebuild, retrofit our cities, 
in places like North America. Some of our cities are contracting, some of our are, are growing. How we retrofit them is going to be very important to our ability to withstand what climate change is going to cause for our, our areas. <clears throat> Excuse me. The third motivation has to do with air quality. This is uh, uh, no uh, news. Air quality is a concern in cities. Uh, the World Health Organization recently uh, published a study focusing on 100 plus countries and 3,000 cities within them, showing that 80% of the residents were exposed to air quality that exceeded the guidelines of WHO. So, so here's a huge motivation again to deal with the transportation issues in our cities. Uh, this is responsible for about 3 mil million premature deaths uh, per year. And finally, this pyramid, this inverted pyramid that I, I think uh, conveys what many uh, transportation planners tend to be thinking these days, which has to do with uh, prioritizing the modes of transportation that do not involve a motor, bicycling, walking, and try to demote the importance of automobiles, single occupancy automobiles particularly, basically learning from our past, but also understanding that uh, these other modes of transportation are helpful for sustainability, are helpful for uh, well-being. So why then intervene in cities to promote cycling? And I normally appeal to this type of a framework, and I'll, I'll walk you through it. Uh, this is fairly used in public health. This is the social determinants of health framework. On the right-hand side, you see us individuals. Uh, we behave in certain ways. We have health outcomes. We might be healthier and less healthy. And as I move to the left, we start moving away from the individual. Maybe I'm looking at the family, maybe I'm looking at the household, I'm looking at the work relationships, work conditions. And as I keep moving to the left, I, I, I'm moving in a more distal way, uh, away from the individual, looking at the neighborhood environment, looking at the city, and then looking at the macro social and historical factors that influence our health. This came to be partly from a disappointment in the health promotion world on individual-oriented behaviors, individual-oriented interventions uh, to change behaviors. Uh, they just didn't work that well with a number of exceptions. For the most part, they weren't that effective. And so the belief is that as we move to more distal areas where we can have health interventions, that number one, we can reach many more people, and number two, we might be able to have some synergies between the individual level interventions and the neighborhood level uh, interventions. If I uh, kind of layer this with this, uh, uh, what I call the onion, with the individual at the core, ultimately what we'd like to do is kind of peel away the layers that influence individual level behavior, and among those layers are going to be uh, the neighborhood level characteristics. So why do cities matter? Well, cities matter because they affect, on the one hand, how much uh, energy we, we take in, pretty indirectly, where the food is located. Do we have food deserts? Do we have uh, ample location of uh, healthy foods, ample availability? More importantly, on the right-hand side, how much energy we consume. This has to do with uh, physical activity and how we design our cities. Think about the regular day, uh, I would say, for, for many Americans. We wake up in the morning, we make breakfast, we go to work. For some of us lucky, we are at work. Then we go home, we make dinner, and then we entertain. We have had the uh, basically uh, designed away our ability to be physically active on, uh, on a regular day. And, and therein lies some of the concerns about the health outcomes that I described uh, before. It is not a surprise, therefore, that the former director of the CDC, Thomas Frieden, said that uh, physical activity was the closest thing to a miracle drug. So uh, encouraging physical activity through planning interventions seems to make a lot of sense. We heard from the previous presenter some of the health benefits of cycling. I want to unpack his figures, uh, his graphs, in a little more detail. Uh, this is from a meta-analysis of uh, 2 million person years that was published a couple of years ago, 2015, I think. Um, the x-axis here is um, met hours per week. Uh, what do I mean by met? These are metabolic equivalents. This is a, a measure of uh, energy expenditure. 
that is uh, measured relative to the, our resting rate. So how much energy do we spend when we're resting for one minute? And we index all other activities uh, based on that resting metabolic rate. To give you a sense, uh, bicycling uh, leisurely uh, will give us about, would, would imply four minutes. Uh, bicycling a little more vigorously, maybe what you might do in a, in a weekend ride, would be about eight minutes. Um, those that are more competitive riders might be around 12 to 15 minutes. So that's how much energy gets consumed in, in those activities. On the y-axis here, you see uh, a risk of all-cause mortality. So this is the risk of dying from any cause. Um, it's a relative risk because we're indexing that risk to those that are in zero activity. So it's relative in the sense that we're going to see how that risk changes as activity, cycling activity, in this case, increases. So here's the relationship between the two. And there's two things that uh, come to mind very clearly. The first one is the negative slope of this graph. So that means that the relationship has uh, its uh, dose response. The more physical activity or the more cycling I do uh, over time, uh, the lower the risk of all-cause mortality. This, this kind of makes sense. Uh, but probably more importantly for the point that I'm trying to make is that the slope is not constant through this range. That in fact, the most bang for our physical activity, for our cycling buck, comes is when we get those of us that are couch potatoes, those of us that are on the left-hand side, to be more physically active. So for example, if I go for a leisure bike ride for about two and a half hours, uh, I would be roughly spending about 11.5 minutes. And that means that my risk of all-cause mortality is about 17% lower than someone like me that didn't do that. It's a great opportunity for intervention here is to get those individuals on the left-hand side to be more physically active. So who, who, who could be these individuals? Who, who are they? Um, Roger Geller, a transportation planner in Portland in 2006, a bicycle planner, divided the population in Portland into four groups based on his survey observations, starting clockwise from the top. He identified a group of people that he called the strong and the fearless. These are less than 1% of bicyclists that would bicycle no matter what. They love bicycling no matter what conditions they're out there, rain or shine, high traffic, low traffic, no matter what road conditions they are out enjoying. Then there are the enthused and the confident, uh, another group of committed cyclists, about 7%. And then it's the rest of the population that's either interested but concerned. These are the individuals that would like to bike, that are not biking right now, but they're concerned about safety, they're concerned about that right turn for uh, their kid to bike to school, they're concerned about uh, cars going maybe too fast, maybe they don't have anywhere to park their bikes at the destinations. And then, understandably, there's about a third of the population that say, it's not for me. I can take transit, I can drive, I'll walk, no way, no how, that's fine. You say, well, Daniel, Portlanders are a little different than the rest of the world. That might be okay in Portland, might not be okay in the rest of the US. And indeed, a subsequent study by my colleague at Portland State University, Jennifer Dill, and colleagues found that overall the percentages kind of really remain the same when you look at the entire US. These are the, the darker, uh, the, the maroon bars here, showing that when you look at the US, uh, maybe the interested but concerned group is slightly lower at about 50%, not 60. Uh, the no way, no house are a little higher, maybe 35, 38%. And then the enthused and confident and the fearless are a, a little bit uh, a higher or lower, depending on which group, than what Geller found. But overall, the proportions remain roughly similar. Therein lies the opportunity. How do we get the enthused and concerned folks to be more physically active? Through bicycling. I also want to make the observation that many uh, of you might, 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 have, might have had, although this is a strong cycling audience, so may, maybe you are the wrong audience to make this observation, but uh, when I go on vacation, I notice a lot of people bicycling. Left-hand picture here, the Outer Banks in the East Coast, uh, North Carolina, beautiful beaches, summer weather, bicycles available, a lot of people bicycling, and yet uh, you ask these people, uh, do you bicycle at home? Do you bicycle on a daily basis? And they'll tell you, no. 
Chrissy Field, right hand side, beautiful views, same story, lots of tourists enjoying uh, their bicycling and yet they tell you no. The answer is maybe three things. One, there's no infrastructure at home to make me feel relaxed bicycling in this context. Number two, I don't have a bicycle uh, accessible to do what I want to do that I rented here. And number three, I don't have time. I don't have the time to be able to go for this delicious ride that I'm doing that I do have right now on vacation. That's why I'm on vacation. So my point is that planning is now moving towards incorporating bicycling into daily routines, what we call incidental cycling. That is getting to places, build it into the regular life so that you can get to the store, you can get to school, to work by bicycling. No need to set time apart for cycling necessarily, given time constraints. If you do it, wonderful, but you don't have to. And at the same time, have the infrastructure to make you feel safe and exploit that interest in bicycling that, that you might have. An added benefit of this approach is that the more people that cycle, the safer it is for everyone. This is called safety in numbers. It turns out that the more cyclists there are on the road, the lower the crash risk for each of us. It doesn't mean that number of crashes will necessarily decrease. In fact, they might increase because the number of crashes is the, res the result of the product between the risk and the people exposed. So that number could go up. But the risk itself might actually end up dropping. And that's the safety in numbers. This is from a colleague, John Pooker, on his book, City Cycling. Uh, he's actually revising it for the year 2020 with, with Ralph Bueller. Uh, this is our, the relationship between the share of workers that go to work by bicycle and on the y-axis, uh, the fatality rate per 10,000 cyclists. Uh, this evidence also has been uh, examined longitudinally for cities that increase cycling, and you see that drop in the per uh, per person risk of a crash. So what's the lesson here? What's the approach? Uh, the approach is uh, what I would call the, the four <laughs> Ps, the physical projects, the policies, the promotion, and the programming. And I'm not going to delve into a lot of the details of each of these uh, uh, specific categories. I just want to focus briefly on the physical projects because these are probably the most controversial ones, uh, particularly for um, leisure cyclists. So physical projects have emphasized uh, uh, recently the separation of bicycles from, from traffic. And a big controversy, in fact, that began here in the Bay Area in the 50s and has kind of spilled over to the 2000s and is kind of dwindling a little bit now in that um, some people suggested that separations was not, was not appropriate, that we, were, we as bicyclists were giving up our rights, that we were being pushed to the margin, and that we can't be second-class citizens. And I, I believe the resolution is that uh, I, I don't know of any city right now that is pushing exclusively separation. There's an understanding that in many cases, uh, mixing of bicyclists uh, in traffic without separation uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, neighborhood streets called in Portland, bicycle boulevards called in the rest of the world, uh, make a lot of sense, are highly preferred. People love them uh, as long as traffic is managed, as long as there's cut-throughs for bicyclists and people can get uh, to destinations easily. In other cases, when there's a lot of traffic, when uh, there's trucks uh, going by, uh, maybe high speed, you want that separation and that's being pursued. Also of concern are approaches to intersections and uh, I think we're still working on that. We're learning from the Danish uh, um, not, not very well, and some of the ap approaches are a little clumsy, uh, but the idea is trying to protect the cyclists at the intersection by providing a little bit more visibility, uh, allowing cars to see bicycles at 90 degrees, uh, so you see them much better than maybe that 35, 45 degree angle that is a blind spot that causes uh, those right hooks that cyclists don't like and then have markings at conflict points. Uh, dry, well, curb cuts, driveways that go through these uh, facilities that are a point of conflict and that should alert both the bicyclist and the driver that this is an area of mixing, an area that you both have to be a little more alert than usual. This methodology is uh, really the, the latest that cities are using and planners are using to think about facilities for bicycling. It's based on the level of traffic stress. 
it's di directly linked with those groups that our Portland uh, transportation planner identified. Uh, level of traffic stress uh, basically tells us that uh, we are going to design facilities for, for different types of users and we're going to strive for low stress. Low stress facilities would be amenable to all types of users, uh, including the uh, uh, interested but concerned. And we're trying to avoid the high stress facilities because those will appeal only to a small uh, group of people. They will be available nonetheless, but we want to look at space in terms of these uh, level of traffic stress. As you might imagine, it covers the characteristics of the road, the widths, the speeds, in, and the characteristics of the bike lanes as, as, as well. So you have this scale from low stress, comfortable to all, to high stress, comfortable to very few. We are in the middle of a study funded by the Mineta Transportation Institute at, at UC Berkeley uh, examining um, whether this makes sense. So we're using crowdsourced data from bicyclists uh, using the Right Report app in Portland and in Austin to see whether what people report are good routes to get from A to B uh, correspond with what we see are high, medium, low level of traffic stress locations. A few other observations on infrastructure, bike sharing. Uh, we are at the heart of uh, many changes. I don't know if anyone has seen uh, the jump bikes in San Francisco. They are just uh, rolling out in addition to the more traditional dock, uh, dock bike sharing systems. Um, different flavors, some interact very well with transit, some complement transit, some compete with public transportation. Not very cost effective overall, uh, but I think the main contribution of bicycle sharing over the past 20 years has been the mainstreaming of bicycle as a mode of transportation. Beyond us, the regular bike users, the bike sharing out there, very visible, and the understanding that this is a way to complement and in some cases compete with existing transportation modes has been very, very positive. I close with two other comments here. The first one is the Sunday streets. San Francisco has a Sunday streets program. Uh, th these are programs in which we close part of the streets of a city uh, to vehicles, open it for bicyclists, for roller skaters, for walkers, uh, in Spanish called the ciclovia. A uh, wide variety of programs all over the world. Some are really frequent, up to 64 times a year, meaning every Sunday and holiday. In other places, it's one or two times a year. Um, Leading examples of Sunday streets are Bogota and Guadalajara. I bring it because it's a great way of allowing the population to feel their city on a bicycle in a very safe context, without cars, with other bicyclists. To realize that I can get from A to B on my bicycle and say, geez, that wasn't too bad. I can do it. That was actually kind of fun. And I lived it as a teenager, was able to get to parts of town that otherwise I would have not gone to in, in South America. Unfortunately, many of the Sunday streets uh, in, the, in the US are treated more like a street fair. They're really short, there's a lot of ven vendors, and there's not a lot of physical activity. They're so short that you just can't go anywhere. You just go back and forth. Uh, LA, if, if any, uh, New York City have been pretty successful at overcoming some of the barriers that I would say are mostly around issues of cost. And interestingly enough, it's about police costs because you need to uh, uh, staff all these intersections or many of these intersections that you're closing uh, with police and that becomes very expensive when it's a Sunday. The last point is the issue of gentrification. This is, uh, this is a very, very difficult issue um, I, I wanna highlight here. Places like Portland, uh, this is already six years ago. Uh, Chicago, neighborhoods not wanting bicycle lanes, neighborhoods not wanting bicycle sharing uh, infrastructure. Uh, Washington DC, the Shaw neighborhood, Minneapolis, some of the stalwarts bicycling cities in the US uh, and, uh, and the neighbors coming back and saying, we don't want this, you want to gentrify our neighborhood, you're, you're bringing investments that, that, that we don't want. And part of the discussion here is, is a little bit the narrative that I've played out, uh, that a lot of the bicycling investments have been justified based on sustainability concepts or uh, economic development, and th this is good for everyone, almost post-political. Uh, how could you not like this? Uh, when in reality, I think one, one self-reflection that's important here is that bicycling 
like walking, was a minority mode, was a fringe mode, and has been for the last 50 years. But what's different is that the bicyclists have been able to alter the process and in some ways co-opt co the transportation planning process to create that inverted pyramid that I identified there. Uh, but unfortunately, we're also replicating some of the same processes that led, for example, to the automobile uh, cutting our neighborhoods in two. Uh, imposing infrastructure without working with neighborhoods to understand how can this infrastructure better serve your needs, what are your needs to begin with, how can we co-create and co-identify with neighborhoods the needs of the community and find ways to have these types of investments work for everyone's uh, benefit. So in conclusion, I would say that uh, there's various motivations for supporting cycling in cities. Uh, Cycling provides tangible benefits to individuals, certainly social benefits as well. Uh, there is really no right way to encourage cycling. I talked about those four Ps, physical projects, policies, programming, and promotion. And uh, to me, there's no doubt that uh, success will require a multi-pronged approach that involves many of the above, including the work with neighborhoods and with coalitions. Okay, well, th thanks everyone. Appreciate it.